Welcome into another edition of Inside Carolina's Next Level. I'm Tommy Ashley. That's Greg Barnes, sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com and Congruity. And this is Next Level, where we kind of do a deeper dive into all things North Carolina athletics, both on and off the field and court. And today we're going to talk about a specific court. That would be Roy Williams Court inside the Dean E. Smith Center. Greg, a lot of chatter over the last couple of weeks about the Smith Center renovating, rebuilding. Let's get into the weeds here. Uh, what have you found out and what have you learned? But let's sort of start from the beginning. I'm going to tell a story first. Smith Center was due to open against Carolina and UCLA, I believe in 1985, November of 1985, and it didn't happen. We all know about the Carolina ended up playing Duke in the first game. I believe it was two versus five. But that November, prior to the UCLA game, my family and I are walking through Carmichael Auditorium. And I may have told you this story, Greg, but others have not heard it. And we round the corner, and there stands Dean Smith standing outside his office in the old Carmichael Auditorium. It'll always be auditorium to me. And alongside him is Michael Jordan on crutches with a broken foot in town to see the Carolina UCLA game and to visit with Coach Smith because he couldn't play basketball for a while with the leg. Got his autograph, talked to him both and all. Carolina opens the Smith Center four months later, three months, two months later, and here we are doing a next level about a new improved Smith Center at some point. Greg, I say all that to say this, lead the way, my friend. Tom comes at us fast. <laughs> it was like 14 years old, and now look at us. Yep, yep. Sweet Child of Mine was, was number one on the Billboard charts um, 36 years ago today. So, um, yeah, wow. Tom waits for no one. It, it really does. Isn't that funny? Okay, so <laughs> I think everybody knows the story of the, the Smith Center. It opened, as, as Tommy said, January 18th, 1986. State of the art facility, uh, and it, it was it was ahead of its time, both in how it was built and and how it was funded, all private donors, um, and back then it, it was the thing, right? And, and here we are, nearly forty years later, um, and the place is is due for a, a massive renovation or rebuild, or as we will talk about, and as everybody knows, watching this. Uh, potentially move to somewhere other place that that's called something similar. Um, but go back 10 years ago to 2013. And even at that point in time, everybody kind of understood that there was a, there was a definite need uh, for renovations within the Smith center. And part of the reason is that the, the concourse as everybody knows you've got one concourse and it is packed on game day. I mean, it is shoulder to shoulder, uh, there's no no place to congregate with friends. Um, if you stand in the hallway and, and chat, it's a problem. You really your only options are to be outside or be in your seat. Um, concessions aren't where they need to be, uh, and of course the big thing is that you don't have corporate suites, which is how you maximize revenue for all these facilities. And you know, travel into the various basketball arenas across the country, as I was able to do for 15 years, uh, there's a marked difference. Okay. Now, when you get to the pro level, those are, you know, cream of the crop for good reason. Those, those organizations bring in this a, incredible amount of money. But even when you go to places like the Yum Center and John Paul Jones Arena at Virginia, um, they're just kind of a notch above in terms of the amenities and, and the modern aspect of what you want for college basketball. And so back in 2013, um, Bubba had an architecture firm come in and kind of draw up plans for potential ways in which you, you reshape uh, the Smith center. And, and the plan called for pretty much re reducing capacity by 20 to 25%, you know, which would get you down to 15, 16,000. Um, but, but adding a bunch of, of suites, and then you're doing some things as best you could. You, ADA comes into play when you're talking about changing concourses and all those kind of things. Um, and, and then you've got to deal with the footprint of the, the building. So there's a, there's a lot of aspects of that that come into play. 
because of the NCAA investigation, that was largely put on held, put on hold at the time. And uh, I will say one critical part of that is what what pushed that along initially is when we start talking about uh, the benefits of the blue zone and how that was a surprise in a positive light for North Carolina administration, how financially beneficial that was. There's there's a tremendous amount of money and revenue to be brought in with premium suites. And uh, I, I know that's a, a difficult talking point for some fans. That is where we are. And we will get to more details on that here in a little bit. Uh, but that's kind of a key component of this. But as the NCAA investigation went along and AFAM uh, was having to be dealt with, North Carolina kind of shifted its focus. The Rams Club uh, used their, their fundraising efforts to really do some tremendous work on campus for Olympic sports. Uh, you know, you got the, the soccer and lacrosse stadium, the field hockey stadium, Karen Shelton's fantastic, uh, the track and field complex, and of course, everybody knows about uh, the Komen indoor practice facility. For the, for the football program and, and for other sports that utilize that space. So a lot of tremendous facility uh, builds and upgrades have taken place over the last 10 to 15 years on UNC's campus. Um, but all along the way, in the back of everybody's mind has been the idea of, okay, you know, the Smith Center, we've got to figure out something to do there. Do we move off campus? Do we try to find somewhere else on campus? Do we just renovate at the site? And one critical part of this is when the Smith Center was built, there was a tremendous um, amount of bedrock kind of on the backside and around the, uh, I guess what, the, the west side of the, the building. And that was a big hassle as you build it. So if you're talking about expanding the footprint, well, that becomes a big hairy deal. And I'm not exactly sure. Of course, I'm not architect by any stretch. I would imagine there's a lot that goes into that. Um, and I know that's part of the conversation as well. Uh, but here we are again back in back in February. Uh, we reported that, that Bubba had put together a working group that included a variety of individuals from the Board of Trustees uh, to the, the Buildings uh, Committee and uh, Ramps Club, of course, to kind of figure out, all right, wh what are our options moving forward to address this. Um, the last time that, that there was any work done on the Smith Center of, of note was uh, summer of 16. That was that you know, $4.5 million project to renovate locker rooms, uh, the coaching area, shower facilities, and then the, the players' lounge. And that was really the last time anything of, of major consequence was, was done at the Smith Center. So that's where we get to now. And uh, I think a lot of people understand that uh, the report came out last week that North Carolina's working group now has six sites that they have shared for potential renovation and or new builds for the basketball facility. Yeah, you mentioned the, the upgrades or whatever to the Smith Center as it's been going. You got new video boards, ribbon boards around. Yeah. I mean, those like th those are Band-Aids and, and, and sort of lipstick on – what you talked about that's just that's kind of normal yeah that's just normal processes of upkeep right exactly and you've got a monster of a building built into the side of that hill there um that to your point about the bedrock i mean it's just a, it would be a massive undertaking so to your point there at the end they've they've come up with six i believe six different options like you said um, to sort of make this a better more friendly home for the Tar Heels, but Greg, ultimately, before we get into that, it's all about maximizing revenue. It, it, isn't that the number one, well above everybody else thing going on here, is that they've got to figure out a way to maximize this revenue in this new era of college athletics. Yeah, and there, there's two sides to that, right? There, there's inflow and outgo, um, and you do want to maximize – your revenue as best as you can, but you also want to do that trying to do your best of minimizing costs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the Rams Club has done a good job, as we mentioned, with the facilities. There's about $100 million um, in athletic 
uh, facility debt that the university is having to handle. And that's from a lot of these uh, bills that they've had. And of course, look, I mean, the interest rates have been so low prior to the last couple of years. I mean, you, you kind of be doing yourself a disservice if you weren't taking advantage of, of some of those uh, loans to finance that debt. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that that debt is there and it's the process of kind of paying that off. So that, you know, that enters the, the conversation as well. Uh, but it really is, Tommy. If, look, you, you want, you've got this incredible basketball facility. And as Bubba said a couple of years ago, you, you go into the bathrooms at the Smith Center and you've got an elementary style, like elementary school style setup with washing your hands and using the bathroom. Uh, That's crazy. Like, it's crazy. It really is. It's like the trough in NC State's Carter Finley in the in the bathroom. That's like the only only other place I can uh, remember seeing that type of setup. And as as Bubba said, that's that's not the type of excellence that you expect when you come to North Carolina for a ball game. So so these are the types of things you you have to upgrade that type of thing at a minimum. Um, but if you're if you're really serious about maximizing revenue, you got to have suites, and that is bare bones line item number one. If you're not doing that, then you may as well just forget the rest of this conversation. That that is the the key ingredient here, because as I said, the blue zone uh, has been a significant success, and I know a lot of people worry about the optics because maybe the seats aren't filled uh, on a on a warm September day. Well, guess what? Optics do not pay the bills. And you've got to generate revenue. And you've got to maximize the UNC brand. Uh, and that's what a lot of this conversation is about. And that's going to be the quote of the show. Greg Barnes, optics do not pay the bills. When when I remember the Smith Center when it first opened, it had, I guess, quasi-suites around the top. And they got rid of them to put more seats in there and, and to sort of open up the back of the lower level. So you get these, you know, double A, double B, C's and D's seats up that are under the overhang. Um, but Greg, when we look at this, um, let's look at these options and, and folks can read the article if you hadn't already. There's a wonderful message board thread on Inside Carolina discussing it with a wide range of thoughts, beliefs, ideas, suggestions. Um, but the bottom line, it comes down to, to six options. We talked a little bit about the renovation part of it. Greg, I know you're not an architect. I know you don't have expertise in renovating large concrete buildings, but how in the heck could they accomplish that without moving the team to maybe Carmichael, which I would do? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that you could do that. And Carmichael would only be one option. You know, one one conversation point that I've heard in years past um, is that if you do renovations at the Smith Center, yes, you would utilize Carmichael, but you could also do um, a Tar Heel tour type of thing. And you could go play games in Greensboro. You could go play games in, in Charlotte and maybe some of these other uh, areas within the North Carolina footprint um, where maybe fans, you know, who – you know, live four hours away, haven't been able to come. Well, now they get a chance to come to a ball game. And I actually like that idea. Uh, really? Really? If, if you're renovating the Smith Center and you have to come up with something a little bit different, why not get creative? Why not try it out? They would sell out anywhere they went. Yeah. Um, Valid. Now, is it, can you get it done in a year? Because if you do that two years in a row, now it's going to be, okay, well, we've already done this once. Do we really want to do it again? But I think you have to get creative and you have to try to find ways that work. Um, and you know, Carmichael, how many does Carmichael hold now, Tommy? Do you know? Uh, it's down to 6,500, 7,000 maybe. I mean, it, they could cram 10 in when they, they got it to the max capacity with the benches and crammed as many students. But I'm without looking, and Lord have mercy, don't quote me, I'm pretty sure it's 65 to 7,000 now with the comfortable seats and all and the way they've redone it. Not a yeah. lot. Right. And if anybody went to the NIT game against William and Mary back in 2010, it was an incredible atmosphere. Um, you know, that place was absolutely rocking, which, you know, makes people kind of reminisce about the, the glory days, you know, back before the Smith Center came around. Um, 
but I think they would have success and you can make it work. I mean, it, it seems like a logistical nightmare to be honest, but uh, you know, that's why they, they make a lot of money. I will say this about the renovation process. Um, you know, Bubba really, really kind of harped on what Dayton did um, with the flight deck. And, you know, of course, Dayton had some money from the NCAA because they signed the contract to be able to host the, you know, the initial games, the NCAA tournament there. But basically what their flight deck is, is they took out a whole end zone section on the upper level of their facility. And they've got this uh, platform that comes out over the lower level seats. And on that platform, they've got uh, just premium seats. They've got tables you can sit at. You can stand against the rail. You know, there's a bar up there. It's, it's sweet. It's very, very cool what they've done with that area. And that's kind of the, the trendy thing now. Um, you know, I'll say this. My, my son's at Elon now. So the Sharf Center at Elon is their basketball facility. It holds, I think, about 6,000 as well. Carolina opened that facility for them back in 2018. So I was able to tour the, the facility at that point in time. And yeah, Elon's not going to pack out a house consistently, but you want to make it a fun place to go. And in the end zones above the seats, you've got all this space and they've got high top tables and they've got various drinks and food stations set up and you can kind of just meander. Um, and yeah, the diehards are going to be in their seat cheering the whole game. But there's a lot of people that want to come to a ball game and don't want to necessarily have to glue into every single second. They want to be able to enjoy the atmosphere in company with friends and those types of things. That type of stuff is important. And the Dean Dome, of course, does not have that. But the reason I bring up Dayton is uh, in order to do what they did, and they added, let's see here, 20, 244 premium seats. But one of the things that was required was expanding that footprint by 25%. And that's going to be the catch for North Carolina is given the bedrock situation and given the natoriums right there beside the Smith Center, can you increase your footprint to be able to do the things that you want to do? If you could do that cheaply, I don't think we would be having this conversation about a working group in other sites. Um, I, I think you would just sign up to do the renovation very quickly that way. But I think you're limited with what the, the site is that you're working with, and that poses some of the problems. Yeah, I mean, people talk about Duke football and clown Duke football a lot. They've done the same thing in the end right. zone at Wallace Wade. It's and great. It, it, and it looks cool, and, and it looks very neat. But you're, you're right. Physically being able to do that with the Smith Center um, it is next to impossible, but Everything has a price, so they could get it done for a lot of money. I would put the team in Carmichael. I'd charge 500 to to 1000 bucks a ticket since they're all about not wanting to lose ticket revenue, and it would still be full. Um, I went when they played Wofford uh, when Cole Anthony was hurt and Baycott had a bad game, and they lost to Wofford. Um, the last time I'd been in Carmichael for a game before that was back in the 80s before they moved to the Smith Center, and it was a pretty cool environment. Um, but anyway, Greg, and we I've got a lot of things I want to talk about here, and we're talking with Greg Barnes about Smith Center renovation slash moving slash how it fits in the new world. Um, they talked about Odom Village. They talked about the Bowles lot, um, those type places. You, you're still going to have the same type situation. You're going to upset the apple cart. I see on the Bowles, or excuse me, on the Odom Village thing, it conflicts with the current master plan of the campus just sort of walk us briefly through those those ideas there. Uh, the Bowls are obviously the best place to tailgate uh, for football games. How could they make those situations work, given that there always seems to be construction on campus anyway, and now you're going to try to build, build a 15, 16, 20,000 seat arena in one of the biggest open spaces on campus? Well, as you said, there's a lot of construction, and, and one of the, the main drivers of that construction is UNC Hospitals, um, which is such a, a pivotal point, not just in Chapel Hill, but but in this part of the state for sure. Um, and so I really think you know, we're, we're talking about kind of uh, the message board part of it. I think people need to understand you've got a variety of groups uh, made up of, of influential people and fans who have just strong opinions about this thing. And some people, you know, we're not leaving the Denny Smith Center. It's, it's iconic. 
we're here to stay. We're going to renovate. There are other people who are like, you know what? We got to get off campus. We got to make use of some of the land we have up north. And you can do a fantastic site, you know, a Nike campus with retail and, you know, it's Chelsea uh, over in, in London. We, we toured that facility. They've got hotels. They've got a concert site. They've got restaurants all in the footprint of the stadium. It's incredible. You could do that type of thing north of campus. And then you've got people who are saying, you know what? We could probably stand, uh, come up with a new arena. You know, maybe the Deanie Smith Center's past his prime. But we don't want to leave campus. You know, one of the best parts about you know, University of North Carolina and attending the school is that as students, you can just walk to ball games. And there's there's truth in that. I mean, that's, that's a big part of it. That's, that's, that's a key component. So you really have three beliefs there. And I think that's really shown in this report. And so with, when you're talking about the Bowles lot in Odom Village, I think those are on-campus options that they're probably the best they could come up with. But to your point, with it being so close to the hospitals and with it being right there at the Smith Center, and it's what, Bowles lot, 620 parking spaces, you're close to the business school. I just don't see how either of those locations are, are feasible um, to make everybody happy. I, I, I think those are probably the two um, less favorable options of all these. Really? And, and, and for, for the reasons that, you know, we just discussed, I just think the, the traffic's a problem. There's too much congestion there. Anyway, you don't want to disrupt the, the Carolina hospitals. Um, you know, maybe I'm wrong. I just don't see those as being the, the most likely options at this point in time. Yeah. I've watched them build the, the parking deck back there in the bowls lot and they're working on the business school even further my question the other day in the smiths we're at the ball game was why, why is that parking deck not 10 12 stories high um you know go ahead and do that and then maybe you could put the smith center there um you you'd still have a brand new arena next to what now you know what would the smith center be if it wasn't the basketball arena just a lot to go around there but greg you said something that i found interesting and it sort of dovetails into all of this, um, the new world of college athletics. Um, and we can talk about do facilities even matter as much as they used to for recruiting purposes and all. But you talked about the off-campus deal and, and getting out there off-campus, say Carolina North, it would involve busing students out there, which is not ideal. Um, but the revenue, the retail, the, the sort of, you know, a go-to spot that everybody wants to be in. How would that play in the future of the school's position in college athletics? But also, how would students feel? How would the old school, we're not leaving the Smith Center. I mean, where do they blend these ideas enough to, if not make everybody happy, at least make everybody accepting of it? Because I don't see a real easy solution no matter what they do. Yeah, that, that's the question, right, Tommy? And I think a lot of people um, are aware of what kind of happened with the Smith Center when it was built. Yeah, and everybody, makes, everybody you know, kind of brings up the fact that the reason we don't have students around the court is because the, the students kind of voted against uh, having to pay fees and everything for the Smith Center. Um, you know, they, they were not the adults in the room. And so I, I think the notion of kind of blaming students from a, you know, from the 1980s for the current setup is, uh, is silly. Uh, I think the adults in the room made a mistake. And I think in hindsight, everybody knows that yeah, at the time it was seen as progressive with the funding and all that, especially with the two generation deal. Um, but if you're worried about creating an atmosphere, you need students to be able to be, uh, around the, the court. I think that's a, that's a key part of it, but because of that history, I think everybody understands the impact that that's had on the Smith Center. Everybody knows about the, the wine and cheese crowd comment from Sam Cassell back 30 years ago now. Um, <laughs> sorry. Tommy. I was in back school in there. I was at that game. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you, Sam um, Cassell. <laughs> but that's, that's kind of what we're talking about. Everybody kind of has that in the back of their head. So because of that, my point is everybody's very cognizant of, of what – the students represent. And that's why so many people are saying, do not move off campus. We really need to be thinking about the students here. 
Uh, and so I, I think that's a that's a critical part of this is, is trying to factor them in. Um, but the the benefits of going off campus, of course, would be like, you you relieve a lot of the traffic congestion because on game days that can be a problem. I've had plenty of people tell me that they they ride the Tar Heel Express from Friday Center and it takes an hour sometimes to get to the the ballpark, um, which is not good. And I've dealt with with parking issues myself, even though I come in for games, you know, two hours ahead of time. Uh, and so, the, I mean, the the whole area around the Smith Center has built up over the last thirty plus years, forty years, which is a good thing. But it also makes game day a challenge. Um, and then the other part of it is, you know, what do you do around the Smith Center? What is there to do? Tommy, you went to Wrigley this this summer. One of the best parts about going to a game at Wrigley has nothing to do with the ballpark itself. What is it? It's everything outside the gates. Absolutely. I mean, it is it is unbelievable what you can do. And look, Greg, Wrigley is is the iconic one. Minnesota, uh, Minnesota around their football stadium and along the street, they're basically their Franklin Street area. They had all sorts of things, bars, food, places to do. I mean. I've been to multiple places, Wrigley being number one, of course, where there's just so much to do before you walk in the door to the game. And I think that, it, that to me, is a – I mean, look at Notre Dame. Notre Dame has built so much stuff in the last 10, 15 years around that football stadium for this very reason, to give people options. So, yeah, I like where you're going here. So that's that's a big part of it, and as you said, the revenue side of things. I mean, you can have retail there, um, which you you only have so many games there a year, and if you go back to having concerts, those types of things. But day in and day out, if you have retail and restaurants and those kind of things, it sustains itself, and it's going to be you know, closer uh, to the interstate in, in most cases, especially if you're going west. You just go up 86 and, and hit on, jump on the interstate there, I guess 266. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to doing that. But you have to get over the hurdle of, okay, we're off campus. Now we got to start busing students up here. Uh, that's not going to go over well with the traditionalists. And so that's that's a lot of this conversation of, of how do you how do you address that? And to your point, is there a way you're not going to make everybody happy? Can you make most people who aren't happy at least accepting of this decision? And that's one of the reasons they, they have this working group to kind of go through all the potential options. And now it's a process of you know, checking with all these different groups and bodies around the community to see what may work the best. So I'm going to pop the big question on Greg. I didn't tell him I was going to do this. I'm going to talk about Johnny T-shirt and congruity first. Greg, I'm going to ask you, your opinion, to, to offer your opinion based on your wealth of knowledge about what they should do. Is that fair? Before I do the ad read, is that fair to ask? Yes, but I want your opinion first. Okay, I'll give you mine first. We're talking about uh, Smith Center renovations slash moving slash whatever they need to do to make it better. Got a couple more topics, but first it's Johnny T-Shirt and JohnnyT-Shirt.com. They are certainly sponsors of this podcast. They're sponsors of Inside Carolina, and they're on the bottom of your screen if you're watching on youtube is the url to go to to get all your carolina needs for gear swag We're talking about basketball basketball gear is a plenty at johnny t-shirt you can go see them on franklin street maybe if they have a smith center with some retail around it there'll be a johnny t-shirt right outside the door you don't even have to walk to franklin street you can just walk next door and get all your needs also, Congruity, Congru matt at congruityhr.com for your small to mid-sized business needs Email Matt. He'll cook you up with an assessment. Again, we're talking about retail and small business and all that kind of stuff. It all matters with congruity and Johnny T-shirt. Greg, my opinion is you, you can't get it off campus. you got to figure out a way to have it on campus. But I also can say this um, as somebody who um, had older people in the family. The Smith Center is a pain in the butt to go to for people that are not um, perfectly healthy and in physical shape, given all the everything we've talked about, the, the tightness, the restrooms and all that. They've got to do something. 
So my opinion is you make it work on campus somehow. I think if it were me, I moved the team to Carmichael. I like the idea of the Tar Heel tour, maybe for non-conference games and all. Um, but maybe in you know in January, February, and March, and you play in Carmichael, charge whatever you want to charge for tickets. They're going through the roof anyway. Um, I'd rather pay for the experience of Carmichael than sitting in paying 185 bucks sitting in nosebleeds in the Smith Center, um, which is where it's going. So figure out how to do that and spend the money to keep it on campus. I think that is of paramount importance for this university. It's what makes Carolina different than a lot of these other places, specifically one in West Raleigh, um, where the students have to bus, where the students have to get to the game somehow. It's interesting. We're talking about renovations. The Smith Center, the PNC or the Lenovo Center, or whatever they're going to call it, it's going to be incredible when they get all those done. So that's my take. I don't. I do like the idea of having a big Nike Arena on Carolina North with retail and a concert venue. I think that's a that's an awesome idea too, for reasons we've talked about. Um, you sort of alleviate the congestion, the traffic, and all. But it's just. It, it is contrary to, I believe, what Carolina's always been about, of having the sports right there in the center of campus. So there's my opinion. When you're watching this, let us know on the message boards threads whose opinion you like best. Here comes Greg's. <laughs> so let's, let's do this. Uh, my personal opinion is different than what I think will happen. Um, okay. I, I am a – I'm a proponent of, of doing the uh, north campus idea or uh, off campus north of town. Uh, I, I think you've already got a lot of parking um, availability up there. If they're not using the airport for anything, I think it's a, a unique opportunity. And then you could repurpose the Smith Center for, for a variety of things on campus. Um, now, I don't think that's what's going to happen. And, I, and I'll tell you why. What I think is going to happen is you're going to see a renovation of the, of the Smith Center. Um, and we've talked a lot on this, this show, Tommy, over the, over the last year or so about conference realignment, um, about everything that's transpiring with NIL and the transfer portal. And all of this stuff goes together. And I think people need to start thinking about renovations and coaching salaries all in the same bucket because that's what it is. Um, a little bit of background, and we've gone over this before, but I want to bring it up again just so people kind of understand. If you go all the way back to 2000, when you start talking about conference payouts, the ACC had the largest per school distribution at $8.1 million. Uh, you know, we're talking about the SECs could be reaching 100 million by the end of the decade. So, just an incredible amount of money driven by football has come into college athletics in recent years. Um, one one way that we've seen here at North Carolina, and we've touched on it already with the Blue Zone, um, is the facilities arm race, and we really saw it in the SEC. Uh, but like Clemson built an incredible facility and they've got the big slide and every step along the way, it seemed like every year for two decades, one of the top schools was unveiling this new football facility or basketball arena that was just a little bit better than their competitors. And we saw it year in and year out. And it was just incredible. Why did they do that? As the TV money came in, we were not yet at a point of NIL. You were not paying players whatsoever. And so this money was coming in, and the schools had to figure out a way that they could recruit better than their opponent. And so you start putting high-end, elite facilities on campus. So when kids come in on the recruiting visits, they're wowed about how impressive everything is. That drove the ship for a number of years. And then when everybody started to kind of get to where they needed to be with facilities, well, then what happens? Schools start paying a lot of money for their coaching staffs and not just coaches on, on the court or on the field. I mean, look what Alabama did with all their analysts. They were bringing in fired head coaches and paying them, you know, six figures to be an analyst. And the list was crazy long. 
So now all of a sudden, money started going to football. Carolina is not immune. Here's an example. In 2016, UNC football spent $7.9 million on its coaching and support staffs. Last year, it was $17.8 million. So it increased $10 million over, what, seven years. And it's not like Carolina is leading the way with this stuff, right? Like Carolina's playing catch up. That's what's necessary. Um, and I made the, I actually looked it up today. Dean Smith, his final year coaching, he made a million dollars. That was his salary. When you factor that, when you factor in for ad- inflation and adjust, he would be the 64th highest paid coach in Division One right now. Insanity. So the money for facilities and the money for coaching staffs blew through the roof with all this TV money coming in. Now what's happened? NILs come come to play. And now there are opportunities for donors especially to be able to uh, fund deals that high school recruits and transfer portal kids can come to your school and, and play and have these deals in place where they can make a lot of money before they go into their professional uh, opportunities. And now we're at a point, in my opinion, where Carolina has really done what it needs to do facility-wise. Yeah, you can do some odds and ends uh, at Keenan for sure. You need to do something at the Smith Center. But your Olympic sports are pretty much covered. You're, you're in a good spot with coaching salaries, although that's always going to be a market thing, and you've got to adjust to the market. But really, when kids step on campus these days, it's not about being wowed by facilities. Facilities are nice. It's about contracts for NIL. They want money more than they're worried about facilities. And so as this TV money comes in, as we've talked about before, the SEC schools and the Big Ten schools already are able to divert some of that money to like facilities and scholarships and whatever it may be which opens the door for donors to be able to fund NIL at a higher rate. And so when we start, I'll bring all this up because when we start talking about Smith center renovations or, or building a new basketball arena, it's not necessarily about having the state of the art basketball arena to outdo everybody else. It's not necessary anymore. What you need is to improve upon what you have. You've got to bring uh, premium seating and luxury suites in because that's going to drive revenue. That's a must. That's a big part of this equation. But you want to limit the exposure on the, the debt side while maximizing revenue. And I think the best option for North Carolina is going to be figuring out a way to utilize the Smith Center as it currently stands and reconfigure, maybe take out the the end zones at the upper deck and put in some some high-quality suites up there, something along those lines uh, to be able to maximize that space because you, you did such a good job. I mean, you give it to all the, the fundraisers and the donors and everything. They did a great job paying for that facility. And so that just gives you a massive leg up. And then look, there's going to be a ton of money involved with renovating it anyway. But when you're talking, you know, 300 million, 400 million for maybe an offsite facility, uh, that gets to be pretty significant when you're already asking donors to start supplementing NIL now. Yep. As I was listening to you, and I'm going to let the show end on that note from you, but as I was listening to you, I was thinking about facilities, arms races, and all that. Does it even matter anymore? It's all about the paycheck, and it's yep. not the grown-ups. It's the NIL and the players. Everybody wants to have nice stuff. Everybody wants to play in nice arenas and nice environments, but ultimately, to your point, it's all about NIL and college athletics. That's why this show's relevant. Even though we're talking about building buildings, it's all relevant in the new world of college athletics. That's Greg Barnes. I'm Tommy Ashley. It's been next level where we've, like I said, we dig a little deeper into things that really affect college athletics, specifically North Carolina, specifically basketball. Smith Center res- renovations, build a new one off campus, on campus. Drop your comments in the message board threads. Let Greg and I know what you're thinking after listening to Greg so eloquently lay it out there, especially at the end. 
Thanks, Greg. Yep. Thanks, Tommy.